with a hot girlfriend. I really love her. I love my fellow man. I really love my car. I love my job. I love my guitar. I, I, I love all kinds of stuff. Um, and there's just so much to love. And why not? And my kids are my life. I really love them. And, and love is probably true in every, every example that I just gave you. Uh, so many, you know, one word in so many applications. Uh, but how does God really love us? Is it the same way that I love my wife? Uh, probably not. Um, and and that's, a, that's a good thing. How should we love our husbands, though? How should we love our wives? Uh, how should we really love our kids? Is it okay to love stuff? Um, you know, answering these questions can help us in our personal and in our professional lives, our marital relationships, and in manifestations of our own faith. So we're going to talk about love in, in great detail this morning. First of all, true love, and I say true love, isn't a feeling. Uh, I know that we associate it with sort of a, a nice, mushy, warm, down in our gut feeling, like when we look at our spouse or our, our children or something, we think, oh, I really love them. Um, you know, we, we even associate that sometimes with God's love, with the presence of God's Spirit. Uh, and yet both of these, the love that we should exhibit and the love of God and His Spirit are related to faith and action, not emotion. And I know it's sometimes really hard to separate those things because we, we feel we're human beings. Um, we have sort of a, a, a weird situation where we've got the Spirit within us that, that drives us. And it drives this vehicle, this car, and it's flesh and blood and, and, and bone. And we can drive it off a cliff if we want. We can do all kinds of good stuff with it. Um, we don't often understand that they're separate. Uh, so when we feel something in our gut, sometimes we believe, ah, that's it, that's the spirit, or that's true love. And quite often it's maybe lust, or maybe it's fondness for something, but it probably isn't true love. Uh, we understand that in Scripture there are four basic kinds of love, and we'll talk about each of them today. Uh, lust or desire, uh, which is fine in its proper place. A fondness for a person or a thing, a moral obligation, and then finally charitable action that comes from that moral obligation. Only two of these are related to emotion. The first two I mentioned, uh, lust and fondness. Holy scriptures reflect all of these, primarily in different Greek uh, root words, uh, epithumeo or epithumia for lust. Uh, variations of phil, as in philanthropia, or Philadelphia, fondness. Agapeo for moral obligation, or agape for the charitable action that comes from that moral obligation. That's probably, in, in church, you're probably more familiar with agape love. You've probably heard that a lot. And, and by far, that is definitely the best type of love, and we'll talk a bit more about what that means. Paul wrote quite a dissertation on love in his first letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So let's take a, a detailed look at what he wrote. We'll read the whole thing together, and then we'll break it up into parts for you. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, your prophets mean nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, love does not brag, it is not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, he is not provoked, it does not take into account the wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love. Abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. What we discover is that Paul's message to the church in Corinth is divided into three main parts. Uh, in part one, we see verses one through three, which in introduce wrong intent. I can have all this cool stuff, I can prophesy, I can have knowledge, I can have all these gifts, but if I'm doing it for the wrong reason, it's nothing. Um, the second part, verses four through seven, where he talked about what true love really is, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail shortly. The third part, verses 8 through 13, uh, puts 
true love and perspective when compared to the gifts. And we'll also go into more detail there. But first, let's read the parts individually again, because uh, repetition is a good thing. It helps us to remember, and it also allows us to focus on each of these specific parts. Again, the first part, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Paul says something that may be shocking to some of us. Even if we have all this really cool stuff that we mentioned, the prophecy, the gifts of prophecy, and tongues, and all these things are healings, um, if we do them for the wrong intent, if we don't do them with the focus of using them, to, for example, to edify and lift up the body of Christ, uh, it's useless. It really does, just doesn't matter. And we understand from Christ that some of those who have these gifts, uh, he will turn away again. Uh, he'll say, I do not know you. Why? Because of our intent. We, we're here today to learn that true love isn't focused on ourselves, but focused on others. We don't prophesy for ourselves, we don't have these gifts of knowledge for ourselves, and we don't love ourselves, but we focus on others, um, as we're about to, to find out. In this section, Paul tells us that even charitable action or martyrdom, even these things that may seem selfless in nature, um, if we, you know, even the giving away of our beliefs, uh, or our belongings and guilt for our beliefs, mean nothing if they're done for the wrong reason. So you might be asking yourself, and rightly so, what's the right reason? You know, what, what makes this okay? And we'll talk about that in just a bit. But first, let's go ahead and uh, explore the, the second part. This is where Paul talks about what true love really is. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account wrongs suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. He tells us what true love is, what it isn't, what it does or doesn't do. Again, he's very clear that love is not focused on self. Uh, he isn't, uh, these, these things, um, you're not patient with yourself, you aren't, um, you know, you don't worry about, well, maybe you do dismiss the wrongs you do for yourself, but you just do them for others as well. We, we don't want to account for wrongs. We want to be patient. We don't want to brag. We don't want to um, be unjust to other people. So these are things that we do to others. This is true love. It's not focused on self. And in the spirit of turning the other cheek to allow for mercy and reconciliation, we learn that love is patient, interested in righteousness only, and in forgiving. This is really critical um, and something that we need to remember, especially for our own relationships uh, with it in our families, maybe between husbands and wives. Because I can tell you from my own personal experience and my own imperfection that there are times when I would become angry at Joanne. Um, and and what, whether I felt it was justified makes absolutely no difference. I would become angry. And yet, even if I'm angry, you know, I, I have to remember I'm obliged to treat her a certain way. I'm obliged to behave a certain way. I, there are things that I have to do. Um, I cannot mistreat her. I need to be just toward her. I need to behave a certain way. If I do this, our relationship will endure, she'll be happy. My immediate anger, my frustration will pass. If we remember this and what true love truly is and how we should behave in accordance with true love, um, perhaps we'll be more successful in our relationships. Maybe at work, maybe with each other. Um, so as we go on to the third part, now that we know what true love really is, let's com compare and contrast these things with the gifts. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then in the future face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide in these three. But the greatest of these is love. 